Let's take another prime example, Michelangelo's David, arguably one of the most recognizable pieces of work on our planet. I've never been to Florence myself, but I'm more than familiar with the wide range of souvenirs I could bring home if I ever do go. David, as a sculpture, exists in real three-dimensional space, having been sculpted by a real person for a singular purpose that is now, through endless reproductions, untethered from that history, outside of art history classrooms and guided tours of the Gallery of Florence. David was originally sculpted to rest on top of the Florence Cathedral, along with other Old Testament biblical figures. But because the final piece weighs over six tons, it was deemed impossible to lift the delicate sculpture 40 feet up to the roof. Proof of this original location can be seen in the size of David's hands and head, increased to try and offset the foreshortening seen from below. In 2010, a fiberglass version was placed where David was originally intended to stand. David's new location was set for just outside the Palazzo della Signoria, the city's town hall, now known as Palazzo Vecchio. What was originally intended as a religious icon was now recontextualized as a political one, standing triumphant outside the seat of government. It didn't take long for David to be seen as a symbol for the power of the Florentine people. After the execution of Savonarola, the charismatic apocalypse-obsessed Dominican friar who established a theocracy in Florence as well as burned much of the city's art and culture during what was called the Bonfire of the Vanities, as well as standing up to the tyranny of the Medicis as the Medici became Pope Leo X, and before Alessandro Medici became the Duke of Florence in 1531. All of that subtext is part of the story of David, but is so easily forgotten over time, only to inevitably end up as a bad dick joke on SNL. Everyone, everyone may have your attention here is the fine specimen on whom I modeled my David on. It is an exact replica of him down to the very atom. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I give you the David. Oh my God. Dude, what the heck is this? Not to say that Michelangelo should have sculpted David differently, but how uninspired do you have to be to approach a whole comedy sketch about David in the laziest, most obvious way possible? Also, quick aside, how strange that among all the copies of David, large and small, that exist on our planet, somewhere in 30 Rock, that copy is just hanging out. Some of my favorite artists are those who make history more visible within the work they make. I want to compare two artists, Fred Wilson and Nick Cave. Fred Wilson is a site-specific installation artist, often working with his own collection of found objects, arranging them into a narrative or recontextualizing a museum's permanent collection to achieve the same result. Through this repurposing, Wilson gives these objects, which are the physical embodiment of history, a visceral quality. Beauty, 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 beauty. I, I'm really interested in beauty. I'm interested in beauty. If you think of beauty as an ultimate visual experience, but I'm also interested in beauty in that uh, it can hide meaning. The world is complex and often we try to separate out all these experiences. This is beautiful, this is ugly. This is a beautiful experience, that's all it is. There is no meaning or the meaning is not important. People have to deal with the fact that there is meaning in beauty. There is meaning in ugliness. And so in a lot of my work, if I can, I try to uh, bring out that tension. The whipping post and chairs is a perfect example because chairs are really beautiful, that whipping post is certainly not. The whipping post and chairs were from the first exhibition I did with museum collections. Uh, was at the Maryland Historical Society in 1992. It's a very traditional display in a certain way. There's no manipulation of the objects other than their positioning. 
uh, and that changes the meaning uh, or the relationship uh, or how you think about them. And this is everything that I'm about when I'm working in museums and quite often when I'm working in my studio. Looking at um, kind of high-end uh, decorative arts, being the chairs and the whipping post, that have a very different history, but it relates very directly in that those people who sat in the chairs had some relationship with, with those who were on the whipping post. Not acknowledging that things are complex, that beauty is complex, I think that's the problem that people want to do that. So I enjoy making it complex for people. Because you know? <laughs> uh, that's my world, you know. <laughs> Nick Cave is a sculptor, also working with site-specific installation, as well as video and performance. He's most famous for his sound suits, full-body sculptures that obscure the wearer's race, gender, class, and age as well as function as standalone gallery pieces. I was always making things. I always have done that. So being raised in a sort of lower, sort of middle class family and not having much, but realizing that, you know, the surplus around me was enough to sort of keep my interest sort of motivated. So I was able to just sort of use and create based on my surroundings. May it be sort of, you know, from nature or, or just things within the house. Um, what's so powerful about that is that, you know, you can make something out of nothing. And that I think, you know, I'm, thank God I sort of, that was my upbringing because I don't know if I was, you know, had the means to whatever I needed material-wise, whether or not it would be as sort of authentic. You have in the exhibition, you have one that's, you know, covered in all buttons, but the, the face of it is a uh, beaded uh, vintage funeral burial wreath that I found in pairs at the flea market. And then there's one that's made out of uh, uh, hats and bags. Each one has its own identity, which is important. It's sort of me sort of uh, interfacing and interjecting, you know, multiple ways of thinking, making, and, and accessibility to sort of this abundance of surplus that's around us. They function as sculpture, but then there's also the possibility that they could be in motion. Forces the viewer to sort of exercise that sort of thought and that sort of imagination. They are sort of bigger than life. And you're, and you're confronted with that. So I think it plays off, you know, ideas around sort of, you know, there's this sort of tension, this sort of conflict around fear and attraction at the same time, which is sort of crazy that we are sort of drawn that way and exist in the world that way. But, you know, at the same time, we're hiding gender, race, class. So we're, you're forced to look at the work without uh, judgment which is really sort of the underlying. What I love about these two artists is their very similar but vastly different approaches to repurposing found objects in the history they carry with them. Their work speaks openly about their lives as black men, taking history and bending it back on itself in an effort to clarify what is so easily lost or forgotten over time. Unlike Theresa May's bracelet, their intentions are clear. In 2018, Nick Cave had a show at Jack Shaneman Gallery in New York called If a Tree Falls, filled with sculptures about gun violence in America, made up of shotgun shells, handkerchiefs, and carved heads, as well as more recognizable Nick Cave materials, including metal flowers and beaded handicrafts. Because it's impossible to attend a cave show without an image in your head of his sound suits, I think these pieces felt as powerful as they did because through Cave's use of similar materials, it felt as if the sound suits had peeled themselves back to show the pain they so triumphantly hide away. Compare the work of Wilson and Cave with the work of Oliver Beer, 
who also recontextualizes objects found in museum collections. My name is Oliver Beer, and I'm an artist I'm from England. The exhibition's called Vessel Orchestra, and it's a selection of 32 pieces from the Met's collection, which I've organized not for their aesthetic and cultural quality, but for their acoustic quality. Every empty space, whether it be a room or a vessel or a wine glass or a seashell, has got a note at which it resonates. And you can hear those notes just by listening. I chose objects that sing only the notes that we recognize as harmony now, so that's the black and white notes of the piano. I've put a microphone in every object in the installation and attached that microphone to a mixer, which is attached to a keyboard. And when I press down the key, like the middle C, the microphone inside is activated. So you hear in real time the musicality of that object. The museum is like a vast multi-chambered instrument just waiting to be played. A 2,000 year old cooking pot sitting alongside a Juan Miro vase or a Sot Sass and singing as valid a harmony as them is what this installation is really about. Every object brings with it its own history of survival. And those individual stories weave a kind of new narrative together and quite an unlikely one. It's kind of leveling of the aesthetic and cultural playing field. And so I've written a composition which runs on a loop in kind of play at piano mode throughout the exhibition. And on Friday nights, musicians and composers will come and play in a live context. I really wanted the performances to be as diverse and interesting as the vessels themselves. As I listened to more and more objects, I started to hear that there were patterns. You start to question, why does this note keep recurring across cultures and civilizations? When you start thinking about a collection musically, which has only ever been thought about visually, all these unexpected stories and questions start to arise. Although his goal is finding and amplifying the sonic resonances within each object, it's worth noting that, as a white artist, he has the luxury of not engaging in the history of each individual piece. Much like the version of David sculpted for a bit on SNL, it's surreal to try and imagine each of the bodies that made these works, forced to stand alongside one another in the Met Breuer as if stuck in a waiting room together. Lastly, the work of Alex de Corte, specifically his installation and video series, Rubber Pencil Devil, made for the Carnegie International in 2019. This house is a portrait of the land I live in. I thought, how do I know my life? How do I know my politics? How do I know my religion? How do I know my love? And I was like, I probably learned it from my family, but mostly I probably learned it from TV. If I were to make a portrait of a place, maybe I'd begin with TV. I've recycled a bunch of old faces into some kind of fresh variety show, making 57 videos for the 57th Carnegie International in Pittsburgh. Live, I think it's cool. Yeah, I think you just let it be loose and it seems like n natural. This is my favorite costume so far, Lou. When I'm attracted to a certain character, it may be just a character that's misunderstood or a character that has a beautiful color. Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty beautiful. Yeah, I think it's really beautiful. Let me know when you're ready. I'm going to put my leg out. I'm going to be sharing this glass of wine with Oscar but the wine seems to pour in indefinitely. And we're actually having, having this drink in a painting by Patrick Caulfield called Dining Recess, but use the slight visual trickery where it seems as though I'm flatter than I actually am. Ready? Action. Pouring. 
Carol Spinney, the actor who played Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch up until recently, was operating Oscar the Grouch and he was wearing his Big Bird legs. Okay. And I thought, All right, that's, coming down. that's this beautiful moment of transition. And turn. And I think we as a country and as a people are always transitioning. All right, awesome. In these videos, I flatten the hierarchy to kind of take away maybe the privilege or the authority that some of these characters may have had and confuse them a little bit. There's this sort of fluidity that occurs where you can take any disparate thing and link them together and they'll tell a new story. I live in Philadelphia and in my research, I was reading a lot of Ginsburg's Fall of America. Coincidentally, Ginsburg's in a music video that Bob Dylan made called Subterranean Homesick Blues. And I thought, how strange that Bob Dylan is making this song about the sign of the times in the late 60s, and 50 years later, maybe this is a similar moment in need of some empathetic conversation. And maybe if I use his words and pair them with my images, I might make sense of America. which is like totally misunderstood. A house landed on her sister, that's like sad. And uh, I would be upset too, you know. Dorothy, I think, she's just like a boring white girl with some problems, you know, where the witch is like an interesting green person that has some serious like, you know, story behind her. I always think of this like science project I did when I was younger about color and how it affects your mood. Was blue make you feel and was green make you feel? All emotions are kind of interesting and hot and exciting. I'm not afraid of them. Thanks. Thanks, Gabs. <laughs> For the 17,000 hours of work to make those shoes. So those shoes should just get wrapped up and put in a safe because they're really special. All of the people that work with me are friends and it's a big family. Shannon's worked all over the world. She's from Philly and like we just do it a little <laughs> different here. We do it a little like more a little more dirty here. We as a studio, you know, all really value material. Everybody went to school for printmaking or sculpture or working with neon or sewing. I grew up working in a meditative way and having those love hours go into the objects. I think of that really great Mike Kelly piece, more love hours that can never be repaid and thinking about like crocheting or the unseen labor. Oh, my God. oh yeah, that, that, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cut. Was that better? Yeah. Hi, give me five. What up? Hi, X. How are you? I'm making all these videos. It's so soft, right? At his best, de Corte's work takes this history, our national collective memory, and catalyzes it with his own life. 
For example, in this clip where the Pink Panther paints a rose lattice in pink, De Corte talks about his family working as house painters. My whole family are house painters, including my brother. So I had this idea to paint this large rose wall pink. Like I'll jump on the ladder, spray everything, yeah. and then you just spray the last yeah. little yeah. at the end. grandmother made quilts and doll houses and did a lot of handiwork. And so a lattice covered with roses is sort of like a beautiful metaphor for my grandmother. If her life was a lattice and the roses were the people that she touched in her life. My family is all I have. My family is everything to me. De Corte, dressed as the Pink Panther, is both himself, the son of a family of laborers, as well as the character of the Pink Panther, a maybe tongue-in-cheek nod to the fact De Corte is gay. Our personal connection to this character may be different, but there's something in the way De Corte treats this bouncy pink feline with sincerity that taps into some deep sentimental part of our brains. It's hard not to feel swept up in the bliss of remembering because it feels like he himself is doing the same thing. As image makers working within a flood of information, I feel it's hugely important to make connections outside of ourselves, stitching our lives into a web of references and illusions to try and better see how we all fit together in our shared histories. We can't stop the churn. The internet is going to be a part of our lives until the sea levels rise to the point we can no longer reach the transoceanic fiber optic cables that allow us to log on. But for the time being, we can hopefully make our screen time less exhausting and more meaningful. As an artist living at this particular moment in time, a product of everything we've ever seen, heard, and done, we're either going to develop a greater understanding of how we look from the outside, or we're not. There's no escaping our history, so why not make that process intentional and purposeful? There's no denying that a major part of being a working artist is hoping for more opportunities to have our work be seen, to take up more space with our vision, to be part of the world in a more substantial way. Although it may be futile to ever know another person entirely, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, however futile it may feel, to let ourselves be seen in what we make in the hope others will do the same for us. To round out this presentation, I'll end with this clip from painter Carrie James Marshall. You could, you could say I am an omnivore when it comes to everything visual. I'm, I'm taking it all in because I, because I, I, I think I recognize, the, I recognize the power that images wield and the impact they have on your ability to imagine yourself as an agent in the world. Pictures don't only express our desires, but they teach us how to desire in the first place. And that's the power of images at every level. For all of us, you know, as human beings who develop from an embryo to a child to a toddler, it's like, well, we, we start out at that stage when words are incomprehensible to us. So our perception of, our, our understanding of the, of the place we are and the people we are with and the world we are in comes from images. And those images shape our expectations about, the, about almost everything. Homework, part two. Included with the second half of this presentation are three famous pieces of artwork. For your final piece of homework, you will be tasked with stealing a major part of each, such as its color scheme, composition, or subject matter, and combining all three into a single piece. Take at least two hours on this piece of homework. It must be in color, though your choice of material is up to you. Remember, you're not copying any of these pieces. It is all up to your own interpretation. Even with the choice in subject matter, 
Use the piece as a rough guide to follow, but don't stress over getting every single detail right. For color, Joan Mitchell's painting, Sal. If you're working in Photoshop, feel free to use the eyedropper tool. If using natural materials, do your best to approximate your colors. For composition, this painting by Neo Rausch. When stealing the composition from this piece, try your best to approximate each of the blocky shapes, but don't worry about copying every last detail. The goal is to use this painting as a framework letting yourself be inspired by its layout, but not recreating it to a T. Feel free to trace out the shapes and lines of the composition in Photoshop to give yourself a little help. And lastly, for subject matter, Granada by Joel Meyerowitz. Much like the last piece, don't get hung up on every detail in this photograph. Look through the photo and choose details that feel inspiring to you. Maybe the woman in the foreground feels exciting. Maybe it's one of the figures in the background. The bird nest. Or maybe the decorative metal objects hanging on the house. Maybe there are certain details you're unsure of and in your own effort to try and figure out what you're looking at, you're inspired to make something else entirely.